Hey, what's up, guys? It's Michael from The Honest Youth Pastor back again with another sermon review today. Today, we're going to be looking at a Beth Moore sermon entitled Traveling Companions Part 1. Uh, Beth or somebody on her team uploaded this part of a sermon on July 6th of this year. Um, my guess is this is actually a, a clip from a previous sermon done a while back, um, but nonetheless, this is what we're looking at. It's not a whole section of a sermon. It's 27 minutes long. Uh, link will be in the description below, but it's not actually 27 minutes long because there's like a commercial break in the middle of it. We won't endure that. I'm going to cut that part out so we can focus on the actual sermon part. But in case you are new here, before we get into this, let me explain the sermon reviews, why we do the sermon reviews, all of that so you're not confused. These sermon reviews are not to take whoever we're looking at and say, oh, these are great pastors or, oh, these are horrible pastors. It is we're looking at the content of their sermon. So what I attempt to do to the best of my ability is separate the methodological differences uh, apart from the actual exegetical sermon-esque differences. So one, methodological differences are going to be things like music, background, things that they wear, things like that. So you can see on the stage there's purple lights, there's something on the stage that I don't even know what that is. Uh, and like, you know, you could, you could tear apart if you wanted to be really dumb about it, you could tear apart what they're wearing. So all of those things are not important. Uh, what we're looking at in the sermon reviews is the content of their sermon. So we're looking primarily at, do they use scripture when they do use scripture? Do they use it correctly? Do they actually stick with the context and the culture? Um, and is it used correctly or do they use it kind of like as a jumping off point? Like, a, oh, oh, well, this verse says purpose in it. And then we're never going to go back to that verse. But we're just going to talk about purpose forever. Um, so that's what we're looking for. Red flags, problematic issues. Uh, are we reading ourselves in scripture? Things like that. So let's get started. Uh, this is called, again, Traveling Companions Part 1. If you want to watch this, I don't know if I've said this yet or not. <laughs> if you want to watch it without my commentary, which I totally get, link will be in the description below. So let's start this and kind of see, kind of see what Beth does. I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and I'm going to be asking you for the names of females that you would be able to answer that question with. And you can use their first initial as long as you can remember it later. Um, or you can use both of their initials. If you get time, you can write down their name. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to answer with the first names that come to you. Because it's not like later you go, now I'm stuck with them. No, you can rethink it later, but we can't take 30 minutes with each answer because if you're like me, I'm going to have to think on it and think on it and think on it. No, first answers that come to your mind. If nothing comes to your mind, you leave it blank because that has a place in the lesson if you can't answer it. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? So there's no... no so there's a couple of things here starting out, right? So this isn't going to, this doesn't seem to be your typical sermon review or sermon given in the sense that um, this seems like much more of a, uh, like a teaching environment more than it is like a uh, sermon environment, uh, just by way of kind of how she's introducing this. She's, she's introducing it by saying, Hey, I want you to write these names down. This is going to be important later in the lesson. Like this, this seems, this isn't a classical introduction to a sermon. Most of the time, you would enter with like a story that might be maybe ties into the scripture or my preference again methodology differences my preference is you start with scripture the scripture you're looking at and then you go into explaining um, but the way she's starting here does not it's 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 not built like a sermon which makes sense because i think probably if you look at the zoomed out parts of this video uh, she seems to be talking to an auditorium full of women so this is probably more of like a women's conference women's meeting um but there is scripture involved in this. I have watched this through one and a half times before I did this. So I'm just like, I'm not guessing like there is scripture involved. So, but it is more of like a, a lesson esque preaching session, but we can still apply that when we're looking at it. We will. So let's just keep going. Reason to be inauthentic in the pop quiz, because that will be part of the process of what you and I are trying to figure out in the scriptures and in our walk of faith together. So what three women would you most likely reach out to the quickest in a personal crisis? Next, what fellow women would you consider to be your prayer warriors? Who do you know that actively prays for you? Anybody already intrigued and in it for the evening? These questions are important, aren't they? So one thing I do want to point out, I, 
other than this sermon, I haven't watched any other. I've never seen Beth Moore preach before, speak before, anything like that. Um, these, the, this beginning part, I mean, we're only a minute and a half in, but you can tell that Beth has done this for a really long time as far as how she's interacting uh, with the with the audience there, kind of how she's leaning in, her facial expressions, her body language. Like, you can tell she's a really good public speaker. She's comfortable in her skin. And that is something that, I mean, again, it's more of a methodological thing, but... Um, when you're up front of people, like if you are just starting to preach uh, or if you're starting to like, uh, you know, kind of get your rhythm, kind of figure out your style of preaching, it can be a little bit awkward because your body language kind of gives you away most of the time. Uh, but the longer you do it, I mean, Beth, I mean, I remember when I was in high school, Beth was doing, I mean, you heard Beth's name as far as books and stuff like that. Um, she's been doing it for a while. She's, she's really comfortable in it. You can tell that she's very much like, uh, I don't want to compare it to Stephen Furtick, but maybe that's an app comparison as far as like, she's very attuned to the people she's talking to. Let, let them, let them sit. Let, let even the fact that you may not be able to come up with answers, let that find a place in what we're doing here in this lesson. Which women can you count on to celebrate with you without a hint of jealousy? If something really great happened to you, what women could you count on to celebrate with you that you would never have to worry? They would have no rivalry. They would covet none of it. No jealousy. Who would those women be? Now, I love this question. Of course, I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> Which women in your life would it be hard to run off? I mean, who just, can you just not run off? I mean, they're just like, they're with you in the thing. Who would be hardest to run off in your life? Which women can you laugh with the most? Who are your laugh? Also, if this seems like it's taking forever, like if you're new here, that's the whole point of these sermon reviews. That's why they're called unedited sermon reviews. I want, to, I want us to sit through this and feel the whole the speed of the sermon, the, the weight of what's going on. Like, so just, that's why we're going through this. That's why I didn't skip over it. I want you to kind of see how she's building up her points, how she's building up. Cause this, this, this part here, though, it seems like, though, it seems kind of pointless. Um, like I said before, Beth has been doing this for a really long time and you can tell because of how she kind of builds this, this lesson up. Cause this is important for later. So just stick with me. Efforts. Which women can you cry with? Okay, I've got to ask you something. Of those two questions, which women can you laugh with the most? Which women can you cry with the most? Do you find with me that it's not always the ones you can cry with that you can laugh with? Some people are really comfortable with you crying with them because they've got that really deep mercy, that real deep empathy, uh, they are, just have gifts uh, of, of mercy giving. Um, others may be the kind that will laugh their heads off with you, but now they're not going to cry with you. When you start crying, they're going to start thinking that they got to go pick up the kids. Anybody know what I'm talking about? They got to get back to work. That's what they got to do. So last couple, are you in the faith? And, and if so, are any of the ones you mentioned? So this here, I want you to just either shake your head yes. So let me make, make clear what I'm asking. If you are in the faith, I want you. So again, I know just to stop this so we're not just watching this all the way through. Just as another note of how good of a public speaker she is, how, how she's drawing her audience in. She's not just reading through these questions. She's not just saying, okay, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, you got your answers. Hold on to those. She's actually doing two things. One, she's leaving room in between, in between these questions to give them time to actually write this down. But she's kind of crouching that and hiding the, the fact that she's giving them an opportunity to catch up with sort of this fill-in language that also, it's kind of two birds with one stone, right? So she's giving them time to write down their answers, but at the same time clarifying what she means so that they kind of get this most the most accurate answer as possible so that they're they're kind of built in now they're kind of they're they're bought in rather they're really bought into this sermon she's about to give because now they're invested because now they're going okay well what are these what are these women that I'm writing down what do they have to do with this entire lesson and now they're bought into it now they're going okay now they're interested so 
Um, whereas a normal sermon would start off with like maybe a story to hook you in. Um, she is using a very, a much more interactive method to, to get them involved from the beginning. So now they are, I guarantee you the, as far as the retention rate of people actually engaging in remembering what she's talking about is way higher than a normal sermon because they're actually having, like she's engaged their brains and they're, I mean, they've had to, they've had to really think about it. They're not just receiving information. They're actually having to go, okay, let's process this really quick. And it's, it's really actually a fast process because these questions are coming so quick. So they're engaged very, very quickly. So this isn't a bad really tactic because, um, again, this is just to be clear, this is methodological in regards to what she's doing here. Um, but she's doing it. And I think she's doing it very well because she's hooking them right away. So everything they write down, they now are looking for how does this how does this have anything to do with what we're about to talk about? So now they're whether they know it or not, as this sermon goes on, they're trying to fit these women that they're writing down into whatever subject she's going to bring up and she's got them hooked from the beginning. So it's not a bad tactic, might be worth considering. You look at all of those initials or names that you've written down so far. Are any of those also in the faith? And by that, I mean believers in Christ. So would you either nod your head at me or would you shake your head at me? Okay, because that becomes important in the course of our lesson. All right, here's, here's very, very important one, the last two. Which women do you most like to talk Jesus and Scripture with? With which women, who are your go-tos when you really want to boast in the things of the faith, you want to talk Jesus, you want to talk Scripture, who are your people? Are you related to all or most of them? Are you blood-related? Like, are you either married into that family, or are they your brothers and sisters? Of course, they're your sisters in this case. We're talking about women. I I'm making the point... Are they sort of obligated by familial relationship to love you and walk with you? Because that is a beautiful thing. We want that huge place in our lives. But what? Okay, time out real quick. I know, again, if you're listening to this, you're going to, you're not going to understand what I'm saying here. But if you're watching this, you're going to see it. This is like the fifth ad like that she like these are built into the video these aren't like i can't click off of it like these are these are built in to to the video they're annoying to me but for her it's pretty smart because these are these are advertising events that she has coming up so as people even though this who knows how long ago this actual video was recorded i mean i, I would guess at least two years but She's still getting she's still getting runtime out of it because people are watching it. We're watching it now, and she's got updated ads on it for things that she's got coming up this year at the end of July, right? So I mean, smart, but <laughs> super annoying. Let's keep going. What I'm pressing for is that we also want some people in our lives that are there by pure choice. They're not obligated to us in any way. They chose us, and we chose them. Would you turn with me to Acts chapter 19? Okay, so this is the pivot point, right? So she spent the first five minutes getting them involved. Now, this is where I will say that if you look back at a lot of the sermon reviews we've done before, even with the people that I have disagreed with adamantly, um, there are things that they've done really, really well. Most of the time, if I disagree with them, um, on a lot of more of their exegetical methods, some of the things that they use to grab people's attention are they do really well. So either they're a great speaker or their illustrations are very energetic. Or in this case, Beth has used the first five minutes to in, to Uber. I mean, Uber. <laughs> I don't know. She, she's very much got her uh, her audience uber invested, I guess is what I was going for there. Um, she's got them very hooked because now they've answered all these questions. She's in great, engaged their brain in a, in a way that most of the time it is not engaged at the beginning of a sermon. And then now she's pivoting directly into Acts 19. So let's see if the question she's had before, if the, if the whole point of what she's had them kind of the exercise she's had them do up to this point 
how it flows into Acts 19 and if it flows in a way that's scripturally accurate or if it flows in such a way that's kind of forced and not so great, right? So it's great if you can hook people at the beginning. That's fantastic. Let's see what that looks like now, now that we're pivoting into scripture, specifically Acts 19. We are about to have a good time. Anybody in the house know, anybody on the other side of the screen know that you can have a good time in the house of the Lord. That you can, you can be free with your laughter, free with your joy, because that is going to be medicine to us. And I want you to see this. Acts chapter 19. I'm going to start reading at verse 21 and read all the way to verse 32. But let me tell you what we're doing because we're, we're catching up with the Apostle Paul uh, right in the middle of his third missionary journey. And so we are going right in the middle of a chapter with him where we're going to see him passing through Macedonia and Achaia. And so he has just been in Ephesus and he is going to depart there soon, but we're going to pick up with him before he does. Now, big things have happened in Ephesus. You would see it in the verse just prior. In verse 20, it says, that in this way the word of the Lord flourished and prevailed. He had seen all manner of revival in Ephesus. And there have been difficult times. They, they were people that had lots of magic arts. And there were all sorts of principalities and powers he was dealing with. There's a reason why when Paul was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to write to the Ephesians that he wrote about a war um, in the heavenlies with invisible powers and principalities, with cosmic powers in the heavenly places because he so encountered it in Ephesus when he was there. So this is where we catch up with him, and he's about to be on the move again. Okay, so as we've talked about before, I mean, she did a great job here, right? So she's got them hooked in as far as very much engaged via, via the line of questioning that she gave. Not only just random questions, but very personal questions questions as far as hey these ladies you know like it's it's not some random maybe you know guessing game it's like they're they're connecting real people that they know now they're hooked now she moves into acts 19 before she gets into the point in verse 21 where she's starting she does what we should do as pastors she gives us background she catches us up she helps us understand what's going on up to this point kind of sets the scene a little bit and that's good because what normally happens is that's a great indicator of, okay, well, we at least know the context now, which means we have, I, I've, I've got so much hope when people would actually give the context leading up to a passage, because then I go, oh, okay, great. This is wonderful. So now we're actually setting the scene so that when we read the passage, we know what's going on. We, we know kind of the, what, the setting that's occurred so that we're, we're not just walking in in the middle of a movie, like in going, what's going on? Like we have a basic understanding, a very flyover view, but still a pretty good understanding of what's happened. So now we're going into the passage with that understanding, with in the back of our minds, the questions she's asked and ready to apply them. See, that's the good thing about hooking. I mean, she's got their attention and now she's set up the scene and now she's going into the passage. So so far, message building wise, this is great because everything is kind of stacking on top of the other. People are engaged, following along. They know the context. Let's go into the scripture. But I want you to notice with me in verse 21, after these events, Paul resolved by the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem. After I've been there, he said, it is necessary for me to see Rome as well. After sending to Macedonia two of those who assisted him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, there was a major disturbance about the way. Now, at this point, uh, the uh, followers of Jesus, that movement was called the way. It is still a beautiful, beautiful name for it, but that's what they're talking about here. For a person named Demetrius. See, and that's helpful. Um, me and my friend Rob recently did a podcast about the words we use in church and how that maybe is misperceived by unbelievers. So, you know, if somebody comes to church and they don't know what the way is, a good thing for us as speakers and pastors to understand is that, okay, maybe they don't know that. So we really do need to explain that so that they're not lost. And she did that real quick, moved on, great. A silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis provided a great deal of business for the craftsmen. 
When he had assembled them, as well as the workers engaged in this type of business, he said, men, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. You see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this man, Paul, has persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by hands are not gods. Not only do we run the risk that our business may be discredited, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be despised and her magnificence come to the verge of ruin. The very one all of Asia and the world worship. When they had heard this, they were filled with rage and began to cry out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion, and they all rushed together into the amphitheater, dragging along, this is where I really want you to look, dragging along Gaius, Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's traveling companions. Although Paul wanted to go in before the people, the disciples did not let him. Even some of the provincial officials of Asia who were his friends sent word to him, pleading him not to venture into the amphitheater. Some were shouting one thing and some another because the assembly was in confusion and most of them did not know why they had come together. Have you ever been part of a crowd that you thought, I don't even know why we're crowded here? Have you ever been drawn to whatever everybody was looking at and you had no idea what the center attraction was? That's what happened there, this huge mob of people that had originally been um, been uh, caused to be um, riotous over the fact that their livelihood, which was based so much in the idolatry of that city, that it was at risk because Paul was coming and saying, anything you can make with your hands is no God at all. Okay, so the good news is, so I just want to stop real quick before we kind of, because we're pivoting now from the reading of Scripture into where she's going to go into sort of the exegetical working through that. So the good news is the things that we do want to look for, right? So the good things we've seen so far is one, it's pretty apparent that Beth Moore knows how to build, uh, build a, you know, a, a, a presentation up to this point, as far as getting the audience engaged, going through explaining the background of the context of what she's about to read, and then reading through the entirety of that section so that we, we see on the front end and the back end the whole picture of what's happening. So now she's going to go in into the focusing in on whatever verses she's looking at, which she did point out uh, whenever she was kind of reading through that. She did stop. I'm sure you heard it. She said, okay, this is where we're going to focus at. Then she read on to the end. And now we're pivoting to more of the fourth part of her sermon, her presentation, whatever you want to call it, where now she's going to get into the the application part and the exegetical part, working through those and looking at them. So let's see how, I mean, so far, if I'm totally transparent, so far, this has been done really, really well. So let's, let's keep going. We have one God, and he is the creator of the heavens and the earth, and his son is Jesus Christ. So it causes this huge uproar. So I'm going to read verse 29 again, Acts 19, verse 29. It says this. So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed all together into the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's traveling companions. Look at that wording, traveling companions. I love that out of the CSB translation. You'd also see something very similar to it in the NAS and the NIV. The ESV, if you're reading out of it, says Paul's companions in travel. It all means exactly the same things. But there's something wonderful about the wording traveling companions. The Greek word that it comes from you would see that it is a compound word. The SU on the beginning of many Greek words means to put together or to come together or with. The rest of the word, if you look in it, you see an EK. Anybody see an EK? And then demos, they'll see that on the end of the word. The EK means what we would see at any of our doors that go out from this place when we see an exit sign. That's related to that word in the Greek. It means out, and this, this would mean this group of people. So it's out from a people that are your own people, out into some other part of the world. I think it will become clearer as we go through it. I want Okay, so... So we kind of have the basics of what she's doing up to this point, right? So now she's zeroed in on 2 verse 29. She's even zeroed in further into traveling companions. I'm sure you saw the thing behind her. It says traveling companions up there. So 
you, you know how to do math. One plus one equals two at this point. Okay. So she's now zoomed into this verse so far. Now we're focusing on traveling companions. She's wanted to put so much attention on this word. She's actually now broken it down in Greek to explain, okay, this is what it means. A fellow traveler in a foreign land. All right. So now we know all that. We now know that the tie-in of where traveling companions, as far as the title of this, either conference or breakout session, whatever it is, traveling companions now ties into what we see in verse 29. We understand the Greek of it. All right. So how, what are we doing with this now? Because this is where I start getting a little, um, I get a little, little wiggly <laughs> because I go, okay, mm, whenever you start tying in the title of the message to the verse, I, I get a little concerned, not a lot, just a little, because now I'm going, okay, uh, did, did, or did you like weld these two things together now? Is that we're going to focus on traveling companions the rest of the time, even though there is so much more happening in this text than that. This, so that's where I start getting a little concerned. Um, now I know for some people they're like, ah, okay, yeah. It's, so when you watch a movie, right? And like, okay, it's the, you know, it's titled the Guardians of the Galaxy. And then you're halfway through the movie and they're like, we're the Guardians of the Galaxy. You go, ha ha, right? All right, so it's sort of that moment here in, in, in this part of her message. We're 11 minutes in, she zooms in on traveling companions. You go, okay, that's what's on the screen. Okay, where are we going with this? Because this, we, <laughs> we've not reached the point of no return. We're just kind of turning slightly to... Uh, so let's see let's see what we do past this point. I want you to notice in the definition it says that it comes from a word that means together or with, and it comes from a word that means a fellow traveler in foreign countries. It's such a gorgeous thing, and if, if you have a place to jot this down the margin or you want to jot it down at home somewhere or look it up quickly, it's Philippians 3.20. I want you to write down that address, and it says this. Paul tells us that our citizenship is in heaven. And from there, we wait for the Savior, eagerly wait for the Savior who is going to come and he is going to transform what he calls in verse 21, these lowly bodies. Anybody? Okay, so we've looked at this before in other sermon reviews. Um, there, there's, there's great ways to do this and then there's not so great ways to do this. And I want to explain that so we kind of all are on the same page here. Um, the Vody Bauckham sermon review we did was a really good example of this where Vody went through a passage of scripture and then he pulled truths from other parts of scripture that lined up with the truth that we see in the larger section that he read. The idea here being that you're, you're demonstrating and showing that scripture is the same throughout. Uh, and giving, you know, giving a little bit of context to that as you're pulling, you're not just randomly pulling verses from places to support it. You're actually showing that like, this is a coherent message throughout scripture, throughout different writers, throughout different times, like God's overarching narrative of, of humanity. Like we see the consistency here when we see a real big grouping of text. And then we see that that's echoed other places. So that, that would be a good way to do that, right? Good way to pull scripture from other places is saying, yeah, so here's the main idea in this scripture. We see it here, here, and here as well in other places. And that really kind of, not only does it demonstrate the truth of the gospel, but it, it gives confidence in the word. It shows that this is this is all over scripture, whatever the topic you're looking at. I forget exactly what Vodis was. Now here, I want you to pay attention to what's happening because it's important for you to you kind of see this, me not just explain it to you. So we started in Acts. She zoomed in on traveling companions, even though there's, there's a lot more going on in that story. And now we seemingly jump over to Philippians chapter three for no reason. Like there's not a connection because Philippians chapter three is talking about our home is not here. It's in heaven. We're waiting for Jesus to come back. Philippians, by the way, again, this is why it's important if you're going to pull from other places that it makes sense within the context of where you're pulling it from. Philippians, when Paul's telling this, I mean, there's a whole different context in Philippi in regards to the, the Philippian church having this real connection to, uh, to nationality, to their government. There was a lot of retired Roman soldiers there uh, that had a lot of loyalty to Rome. So when Paul's talking about your home isn't here, like, there's a whole different context where he, he's reminding them of where their home really is, where their, where, their, where their loyalty really should lie. There's a whole bunch going on in Philippians. So when we just kind of pull that text over, that's concerning because we haven't given the background now for that. Um, 
and it seems like this loose thing. We're talking about traveling companions. Now, all of a sudden, we're talking about our home isn't here. So I just want you to see that real fast. And then let's see how she kind of draws Philippians into what we're talking about here in Acts, specifically uh, to traveling companions. Because we know, here's, here's what we know. Beth knows how to build a sermon. We've already saw that. We've, 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 I mean, she's demonstrated that really well up to this point as far as how to just keep bringing you in. So this isn't an accident that she's bringing Philippians into this passage. So let's see what, why she's doing that. How is she building that in? My body been feeling lowly lately. These lowly bodies, he's going to transform our bodies into these heavenly bodies that are going to last forever and ever with him. Okay, she has a commercial break in the middle. I'm going to skip past that and then we'll start again. And we're back. Here we go. And from there, we wait for the Savior, eagerly wait for the Savior who is going to come and he is going to transform what he calls in verse 21, these lowly bodies. Anybody's body been feeling lowly lately? These lowly bodies. He's going to transform our bodies into these heavenly bodies that are going to last forever and ever with him. So it's this gorgeous picture that you and I, we're drawing this parallel conceptually with what we're seeing here. We're called to have traveling companions. You and I are in a foreign world. Okay, so do you see what's just happened? She's taken the reality of what's happened, like this narrative that Luke is giving us in Acts of Paul and the events happening, the gospel going forth, the fact that the idol makers are very upset because they're losing money. So they're, they're going, they want something to happen up to the, up to the point they probably want to kill Paul. His buddies get pulled along instead of him. He actually, in the verses we read, right, wanted to go in, but people knew that if he went in, what was going to happen to him? And they're like, no, you can't. So there's a lot going on here and we zoom in on the traveling companions. Okay. Oh, or whatever. But now she's, she's made that the main point. And then she's brought in verses from Philippians to be like, all right, you need traveling companions while you're in this foreign place until Jesus comes back. And she's, she's mushed these two things together that don't, they don't go together. Like you're, you're forcing Philippians onto the narrative of Acts, and that's not what Acts is talking about. I mean, if you want to focus on, you know, you know, we're not we're not of this world. We have a different home. Like, just go to Philippians. Just start there. Um, but I want you to see that she can't do that. And this is where the whole message goes sideways. Like we we've done so well up to this point, and now we're just like. Where the car's been driving and it just gets T-boned right here because we've been going along in a really good, a really good track. And then just bam, Philippians, Acts, you're going together whether you want to or not. I have to talk about traveling companions. So we're going to do this thing, whether the scripture says it's in here or not. And this is a classic example of grabbing really just a descriptor of what of, of people that that are in a situation and now making the descriptor the point of the whole message and because beth is smart enough to know that the descriptor can't be the sole part of the message she brings in a, another verse that has nothing to do with what we're talking about in acts and then stacks them on top of each other to make some sort of weird terrible sandwich so let's see let's just see how much we can bang these things together and try to make it work if you've not felt that lately, it may be that you are still in secret agency of some kind in your faith. That you try to hide it enough to where you can just get along in your, in your workplace, in your uh, social life, wherever it may be, because that just feels a lot safer. And I'm not condemning that. I'm just saying that what we're called to is that we are strangers in a foreign land. And, and we're... So we are strangers in a foreign land. So she's taking Philippians. Now listen. Here as ambassadors, I've got to tell you something. We have a couple of women here, Beth and Kalani. I've got them right. Okay. So here's the thing. I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not saying she's doing this liber deliberately to distract from the reality that somebody might pick up on the fact that these two things just don't go together at all. Right. So I'm not, I'm not 
wanting to accuse her of this. I'm just saying that it seems a little bit suspicious that we bang these two things together and now we're we're going to completely distract you from that and and distract you to something else that's happening with a little night a little, nice little cute story so that you don't think about this thing too much because if you think about the fact that acts and philippians just don't go together you might sit there too long you might think about it and that will be good because then you'll realize that these things don't go together but so that you don't realize that we're gonna we're gonna tell you about these two ladies that came to the conference now I'm not saying that's what she did I'm not saying because I'm telling you, she's done a great job up to this point till that just till we just T-boned Axe with Philippians. We were going along pretty good on this trip. Um, I'm just saying that she's a very skilled or uh, speaker, orator. Is that what you call it? Um, I'm obviously not that. Uh, she 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 knows what she's doing. So I'm just saying, if I was to guess, and I was as skilled of an orator as she is, I might do something similar. But let's let's keep going here on the very front row I'm not going to make them stand up and wait but they can at least hold up their hand hold up your hands right here you need to know something I told them today they came to the ministry today because every single Tuesday we just open the doors from 12 to 1 anyone who needs prayer any girl any woman we just welcome them and pray during that lunch hour that's a pretty cool idea I'll throw that out there so for all the 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 shade of possibility of distraction that I just said that particular idea that she's talking about is one. I mean, it's, a, it's really good. And so they came today to see us and had driven all the way from Iowa. And I, mean, I said to them, I said, you know, I hope you're coming tonight because, you know, not only is the lesson for you, you are for the lesson. I mean, you talk about traveling companions. When there's something you're after in the spirit, and man, you are willing to come together, get in the car, and drive hours and hours and hours because you think God has something for you. I call that a traveling companion. Now, I want you to see a couple of exhortations that we're going to make based on the way our journeys parallel. So we see that in this particular picture, he is with Aristarchus, he's with Gaius. These are Macedonians who were Paul's traveling companions. He had sent off Timothy and Erastus. We already saw them earlier in the passages. He sent them off elsewhere, but these are his other traveling companions, and they're all caught up with him in this crowd. Couple okay, so there's a couple things here that I want you to notice. Theoretically, except for the point she's about to make, you could use pretty much any scripture where Paul writes, uh, and I am with so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so, and make this a traveling companion sermon. Um, if you don't want to include the next thing she's going to include, but it's convenient that she's going, that the next thing happens because it goes right into her message. But I just want you to see, like, this is a narrative situational thing for our knowledge to know that Luke thinks is important to pass on to the reader. There's a much bigger story happening here, aside from Paul's traveling companions. And she's already made a, she's made a point that she'll make again, but she made it really quick that the text doesn't explicitly say, which that we are called to have traveling companions. It's not, that's not what the text says. Now, could you make the argument that we are, as believers, supposed to be in a, in, in a body of believers together to sharpen one another, to teach one another? Yeah, you can make that argument. Um other scriptures make that argument better than this one that's not the point of this one but um but we have to make it the point of this one in order to make the sermon work for traveling companions <laughs> let's keep going a couple of exhortations and the first one is this recognize that all of us in christ are travelers and ambassadors in a foreign world on our way home i have to tell myself continually this is not my home. This is not my home. When I feel uncomfortable here and when I feel like I do not belong and when I get up and I think I have awakened on Mars, does anybody know what I'm talking about? This is not my home. And this is not, if you are in Christ, this is not your home. There is a reason why you feel like you don't fit here because you do not. You are traveling through. You are an ambassador while you're here. But this ground... Is it not supposed to feel homey to you? 
We were told from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3 with the fall in the garden that the earth would produce thorns and thistles for us. Okay, so that's an interesting thing that she brings up, and that's something that I want to, I want to, to look at real quick. All right, so in Genesis three, she's talking about the curse. She's talking about the fall. Now we have to understand that in Genesis three, there are specific curses given because of the fall and what happens in the fall. But the thorns and thistles thing, I mean, these curses are specific to the person to to who did what. Okay. So in Genesis chapter 3, we have the fall, and then we have God come to Adam and Eve, and uh, he talks to them, and he tells them a couple different things. Now, God has three different things he says. So in verse 14 of chapter 3, he talks to the serpent. In verse 16, he talks to the woman. And in verse 17, he talks to Adam. So she said thorns and thistles. All right, so let's see exactly what it says. So let's start, let's skip over the serpent and go to verse 16. To the woman, he said, you will surely multiply in your pain in childbearing and the pain you shall bring forth a child. Your desire shall be for your husband and he, and he shall rule over you. That's what God said to the woman. Verse 17 is what God said to Adam. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree in which I command you, you shall not eat of it. I'm sorry, you shall not eat of Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till, until you return to the ground, and out of it you, from, for, from out of it you were taken, and for the dust and to the dust you shall return. Now, that may seem like a very small thing to you, that she, she, because technically she's right. At the fall, it was said in verse 18, thorns and thistles shall bring forth for you. But where did that say that? She's already said she's specifically talking to women. She's specifically talking to women about the fall. She's specifically talking about tying this in to this isn't our home. This isn't, you know, if you fill out a place. Um, but why does she bring up the curse given to Adam and not the curse given to Eve? I'm just, you, you do with that what you will, but that is a curious thing t for me. I don't know why she, I don't know why she did it that way, but it's very curious to me that in Genesis, it's laid out specifically, God said this to the serpent. God said this to the woman. God said this to Adam. So why does she apply Adam's curse to everyone, even though these curses were broke down separately? Just a thought. Because I don't think if she said, she said to this women's group uh, that you will multiply in child, pain in your childbearing, it's going to hit quite, as, quite the same. That's just, my, that's just my take. And I think about those things. If it's not thorns, it's thistles. If it's not thistles, it's thorns. There's always something poking us. Is that fair to say? Always something uncomfortable. Because this world was not meant to be homey to us. Actually, and again... This is just something else. And I'm just thinking of this, so I could be wrong on this um, because I haven't thought this through all the way. But she's talking about how this world isn't our home, but she's deliberately starting in Genesis 3 and not creation. So God did make the garden for Adam and Eve. He made it perfect for Adam and Eve. This is what, this is what they were supposed to have. And then the fall happened and they were separated from God. They were kicked out of the garden. They were cursed. And now the thing that was actually supposed to be for them, they now have to work for. Like the thing that was supposed to be effortless for them is now only going to come to them through hard work and pain. So this connection she's making between this world isn't our home, there's always thorns, there's always thistles, that's not entirely correct in regards to how exegetically you would look at Genesis, nor is it what Paul is talking about in, I mean, he's not, he's not tying what he's saying in Philippians back to the creation narrative, because he does do that. Like when, when Paul wants to connect his ideas back to the Old Testament, he's not shy in doing that. He does it all the time, but that's not what he's doing in Philippians. So we have a lot of different issues happening here between exegetical work, between staying with what's actually in the narrative of what Lou's talking about in Acts 19. Like, there's, we're all over the place at this point. And because we're all over the place, like, we can't focus on is, is what she's saying accurate. And I would argue with, up to this point 
She's misinterpreted Philippians. She smashed it into Acts 19. She's actually wrongly taken uh, words out of Genesis and applied them to everyone when they were specifically applied to Adam. Um, and she's not only is she taking Philippians and smashing into Acts, now because Acts and Philippians are shoved together, she's now taking Philippians and smacking Genesis with it and making Genesis say something it doesn't say to connect it to Philippians. It's just, it's a tornado of a mess right now. Let's see if she can recover it. We got a different place that we're headed and we belong in a home that we have never seen. You have a room waiting on you that is already furnished for you that you have never laid your eyes on. And it will be the first time and it will be my first time that we ever take a deep breath and exhale and say, I am finally home. He says, we have a better country. I'm so thankful for the country that I get to live in. Okay, and see what she's doing again. So she's taking Philippians, then she's taking Genesis, and now we're taking Hebrews 11, 16. And we're just smashing all of these texts into Acts 19. But at the very end of Hebrews chapter 11, it says, they knew that what they were looking for was not going to be here. That they were longing for a better place that they could call home. That would Who's they, by the way, right? Just take a minute, read chapter 11 of Hebrews and see who they're, who, who, who they're, talk, who, who they're talking about. Who's the they? Be their forever home. Recognize that all of us in Christ are travelers and ambassadors in a foreign world on our way home. Number two, be willing to stand alone, but don't walk alone. I want you to look at one another and say that very thing. Be willing to. So before we get into point two here, the be willing to stand alone, but not walk alone. You would be hard pressed to tell me that anything she said in point one was backed up biblically when you actually look at the text. So let's see what she does with point two. To stand alone, but don't you walk alone. Say it. Don't you walk alone. Listen. It's the most beautiful thing when Paul says toward the end of his very last letter, his very last letter, and we're going to talk about it a couple of times, make reference to it in today's lesson, in 2, Corinthians, in 2 Timothy, rather, 2 Timothy 4, his final lesson and his final words. And he talks about being on trial, and he said, In my first defense, no one stood with me, but all deserted me. May they not be held accountable for it. But he says, But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that the message would be fully proclaimed for all the Gentiles to hear. And so, I was delivered from the lion's mouth. And it's such a beautiful statement because he's saying, man, we have got to be willing when we must to stand alone in our convictions. Even if we look to our right and we look to our left and in that stand, we don't find another soul with us. We have to be willing to stand alone, but we are not called to walk alone. And there's a... So where is she getting that we're not called to walk alone part? I, I just want you to, I mean, really think about that. Because the only thing she's mentioned as far as traveling companions is the verse that, I mean, at this point, it's a long distant memory. Maybe we'll come back to it. Maybe we won't. Um, stay tuned to find out. Um, back in Acts with traveling companions, we kind of, we just totally ripped that out of the narrative that Luke was telling. And now we've apparently blanket applied it to everything we're looking at to where we're not called to walk alone. One, that's not what that verse said, but okay. I mean, we're already smashing everything else together, so let's smash this together. I'm, I'm just saying, like, what's, what's frustrating, and I think you can tell, what's frustrating to me is that she did such a good job building, the, I mean, she, she, she captivated the audience's attention. She told the background, so then we roll into that. Now that we're, the audience is captivated, now we're into the context, and then we go into the verse. We read all of the, 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 the chunk of scripture that she's already told us about the context of we're, we're in it with her and we want okay wh where we're going from here like this is like we are going and rolling along so well so captivated and then we just get t-boned i mean the the moment this sermon went just totally crazy is when we felt when she felt like she had to bring in philippians into acts and here's my concern if you're not if you don't understand um exegetical work as far as you know making sure that these verses go together making sure what she's saying 
in regards to the original scripture that she read is actually true. Um, if you don't know, you know, that you can't just take a phrase out of a narrative and be like, well, this is our main point now, when that's not the main point of the text. Like, if you don't know those things, she's built so much trust up to that point that you're already along for the ride. Like, you're buckled in. You're attentive. You're dialed in. You want to know how the questions you answered at the beginning tie into this. And because they were your family and your friends that she was asking you about, she hooks you again right before we get T-boned by Philippians. She hooks you with the traveling companions and you go, oh, that's where my questions fit in. So you don't even see that Philippians smacks us across the face. And if you did kind of start picking up on that, you're distracted immediately by the two ladies that drove a really, really far way to get there because they're traveling companions too. And then we go back into Philippians and then we start applying things in, in places they don't apply to, but they're relatable, right? right? They're relatable. We, we're uncomfortable in our own skin sometimes. We know this world isn't our home. Hey, thorns and thistles, you know, the fall happened. That's why you're uncomfortable, right? So, so the, we're, we're sticking things in that are relatable, but ultimately do not connect to the text we're looking at. And the text we were looking at, we're not actually talking about the context of it because we've yanked out a phrase that connects to us personally, and it connects to the title on the screen. So this must be right. Do you see how something so good could go so south very quickly and nobody would nobody would be able to tell? That's where we're at. That's where we're at right now. The very big difference between the two things. Did you notice with me in the scene that they are just caught up in it moving with him? I want you to see it again in 29. So the city was filled with confusion. They rushed all together into the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, who were Paul's traveling companions. I mean, they're just like being dragged along, going like, you know, I don't know how we got ourselves into this. They are literally being dragged into a trial with their death possibly pending. This isn't a, I wonder how we got here. Like, it's not like a, it's not like a, a record screech and the, the thing pauses and then some voiceover goes, hey, here we are again. Like, that's not what's happening. They are being drugged into an amphitheater with the possibility of dying by this entire mob that, that is, is dangerous because they don't even, by Luke's own account, they, half the people don't even know why they're here. They're just riled up. Keep going. Thing about traveling companions is they can drag you into some stuff. And we can drag them into some stuff. And we walk together. Even if we might not always take the same stand, we still walk together. And, and here's the thing, and this is so important to know. When so many of us will say, well, I don't agree with them on everything. I ask you to tell me. To I ask you to tell me <laughs> how, how not agreeing on everything has anything to do with what's happening within the text that we've looked at. Was that mentioned once? No. And if you want to get really technical, you can look at other places where Paul does disagree with people and he sends them off on their own thing. Today, who do you know that you agree with on everything? I mean, honestly, I'm asking you. Because if you have found that person, my guess is they want very much to win your approval. So they just act like they agree with everything you say. Because I just don't know. I do not know that you're going to find the person that everything you say, every preference you have, they're right there with you. Beth, can we be traveling companions? Because I don't agree with anything, that you're, hardly anything you're saying here. But we can be traveling companions even though we disagree, right? That's what you just said came out of your own mouth. So I'm looking forward to that invite to wherever we're going. I'll let you decide. Every way you interpret that, they're right there with you. The way you, uh, you express yourself, right there with you. I just don't know where you find that. And, and I think it's very important for us to know that not, we're not going to all be willing to die on the same hills. But we want to be close to one another going, die well. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Die well. Die, I'm right. Now, I don't know if this is, and I don't, I mean, whatever. You might get mad at me for saying this. I don't care, really. Um, I don't want buddies that are letting me die alone on a hill. 
I mean, can I be real frank? If, if, if I, if you're traveling with me, if you are my companion in this journey, uh, and you're not beside me dying on this hill with me, I don't know if I want you in battle. <laughs> like it sounds to me like I'm fighting this battle on my own and you're over here. Yeah, you can go for it. Mm, yeah, good luck. That's not quite a, that's not a traveling companion I want. Not here, da well, da well. Listen, if, if your team member strikes out or hits a foul ball, you don't have to call it a triple. What a triple when you know it was an out. You might know what I'm talking about. That being traveling companions doesn't mean we lie to one another when we think, you know what, actually that was an out or it was a really foul ball, but way to hit that triple. I don't need that from my traveling companions and neither do you. I need authenticity. I need to know that who's close by even if I blow it. That they're just like, they know my heart, I know theirs. And, and we know we have this common bond that we are chasing hard after Jesus. This would be a good part to kind of interject this. So for all the junk I've given her up to this point, I don't know Beth's heart. Okay, I don't. This is, this is literally the only message I've ever seen this woman preach. Okay, I've, heard, I've heard a lot about her. Okay, um, I don't know her. I, all I know is from, from Twitter and the Internet. Um, but I can tell you this, this sermon is a, a dumpster, but Beth, <laughs> I, I, I trust that you're chasing after Jesus. I'm just saying that this, like, I'm not going to agree with you. I'm just telling you this is trash and you need to do like, I know, like, it's just me. I'm this guy on the internet making sermon reviews and you're, you obviously are, are much bigger, but this is bad. This is really bad. This is bad. And again, let, let me pull back from the best situation real quick. So, to stay true to what these are for. This isn't just Beth that does this. I mean, I, I could name five or six small church pastors that I've seen do the exact same thing that's Beth doing, that's Beth is doing right now. Like starts off really well, draws you in, and then these verses come from nowhere and you don't you don't even know where they're coming from. You can't dodge them, can't you can't like you don't know. You're just like, does this go? I guess it goes together. Like this isn't just a Beth Moore thing that that's happening. I'm assuming she might do this every time. I don't know. I know she's definitely doing it here. This isn't just a Beth thing. Like this is something you need to look for in a lot of people's sermons. In which like we're not we're not even following along with what's happening now. Like you do you remember the last time we even talked about Acts 19 in this sermon? Like it's so far back at this point. So, so we'll end with this because we're, we're right at about an hour or a little after. You have to be studying scripture yourself and know how to study scripture so that you can catch when somebody does, when somebody really hooks you in because it appears that they're doing a good job of actually teaching scripture. And then out of nowhere, you get hit like a train by just acts, just absolute, just ice Jesus of just taking all of these texts and trying to squish them together and apply it to me now. And I don't know what's happened. Like that's what happened. So real quick, do you remember when she asked the questions at the beginning? I mean, that's it's a wonderful. I mean, she got people engaged, not just by telling them information, but making them think they're hooked in tells them the background of the passage we're about to read. So now we're already we're already connected. We go, okay, this is what's happening in this passage. Then she goes into Acts 19, reads a huge section of scripture. Okay, this is what's happening. This is what's happening there. Okay, how do I connect with these questions to what's going on? And then she pulls that statement out, slaps Philippians on top of it, slaps it with Genesis, slaps it with Hebrews, now it doesn't mean anything like it would actually meant within the context. And now we're sitting here going, what? Okay, yeah, traveling. We all need traveling companions for sure. Yeah. And we, we need to be able to stand alone even with nobody stands with us. Even if our companions are over there. We don't have to agree with our companions on everything. They can let us die on a hill. Yeah. Do you see what kind of, I mean, this has nothing to do with Acts 19 at all at this point. It never had anything to do with Acts 19. Acts 19 was specifically about the gospel so transforming an area that the pagans in that area were ready to kill Paul because of what the gospel had done to their businesses. 
That's what Acts 19, the section she read about, was about, is that when the gospel transforms an area, it so transforms it that the pagans in the area, the people that do not follow Jesus, are so disrupted that their very businesses are disrupted. They can't operate the same way anymore because the gospel is transforming lives so significantly that it's transforming the area, not by laws coming down from the government or from the top, but by the Holy Spirit going into people's hearts and minds and transforming them. And now they're different people. That's Acts chapter 19, this last section. And they're so mad about it. They're gonna, they want to kill people. It's not about your traveling companions sitting there patting you on the back, being really transparent with you. It's not what Acts 19 is about, guys. So we need to be able to look for this sort of thing. Understand that you can't just pull scripture from everywhere and slap it on something and make it apply because that's not how it works. And when we do pull scripture from other places, such as she did in Genesis, we need to see if it's even in context because it's not. So Genesis isn't written in the way it's written. So you can just be like, no, well, the thorns and thistles applies to everybody. It was written in such a way that that was Adam's curse. It's important. That means something. All right. If you want to watch the full thing without any of my commentary ranting or upsetness, you can check out the link in the description below. Guys, if this was helpful, give it a thumbs up. Let me know what you thought in the comment section. And if you really liked it, share it with somebody else. I'll talk to you later.